So in the last video, I showed you a bit of logic that led to this little equation here, which basically says that the mass of an entity of a particle maybe is equal to the uh, permeability of free space times uh, two charges over some distance. So the main reason I'm making this video is to deal with the unit vector because Robert Distinti actually places the unit vector into his force equations. And so you'll see the unit vector is here. This is like a, an R with a little hat. This is called a hat. So when the R has a little hat, it is a unit vector. And so, um, so what I want to do is I want to show you how to get from a force equation to an energy equation because in um, my previous video what I showed you was the logic to go from Coulomb's law to e equals mc squared and so Coulomb's law is a force equation and force uh, equations are um, vector equations and so they have direction which is why here I have the little arrow here over the f so force has a direction and I'm also placing a little um, a little hat over this D. This is the unit vector here. And so because Robert Distinti uses the unit vector, I thought it was important to run through the logic of how to use a unit vector and how to convert from a force equation, properly convert from a force equation to an energy equation. So in the previous video, I started with Coulomb's law. I started with Coulomb's law, which uh, Robert Distinti has up here. This is basically Coulomb's law. This is Coulomb's constant here, which he calls Ke. So this is the electric constant. Km, as he calls the magnetic constant. Um, and so the, um, the electric constant is 1 over 4, ti 4 pi times the permeability of free space and which I fold into this, um, this epsilon 1 uh, term here. So this is, this is um, Coulomb's constant. This is charge 1, charge 2 over some distance squared. And so there you'll see my language diverging from, from what Robert Distinti is doing because he uses R and I use, um, I use D. I use D because really, really what we're talking about is the distance between charges. When we're talking about Coulomb's law, we're talking about the distance between charges and we're not talking about a radius. We are really more interested in the distance between charges. In fact, there's actually two things that I believe nature cares about, if you want to use that language. Not that nature cares about anything, but if there are constants of nature, it's my opinion that they're going to be talking about distance between charges, but also boundary conditions. So nature, you know, if you want to want to understand nature, you have to actually look at nature. And so what I discovered when I looked at nature, and you look at biology, and you look at how the atom works, and you look at um, things at, at different scales, um, I've come to the conclusion that nature um, doesn't really care about radius. Nature cares about charge separation and boundary conditions. Okay, charge separation and boundary conditions. And so, um, you know, radius might be just something that is an emergent property of a boundary condition. Uh, i.e. the circumference of the circle, the radius is, you know, 2 pi, sorry, circumference divided by 2 pi, and so that is how the, um, that is how the radius is related to the boundary condition, but um, I think, so what we're going to find is that the charge separation and boundary condition are in fact um, closer to the truth in terms of constants of nature. In other words, if I found constants of nature where the constants interpreted as um, charge separation and or boundary condition, circumference of the circle, for example, um, then I would, uh, then those 
parameters would be much more meaningful because the parameter can be mapped to something uh, physical that is easy to understand. Everyone knows charge separation. Everyone knows what the you know boundary of a circle is, the equation for the boundary of a circle, the equation for a boundary of a sphere. So, um, so if the constants of nature interpret as charge separation and boundary condition, then I believe we're closer to the truth in terms of understanding uh, or mapping these equations to what is actually going on in reality. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to rederive E equals MC squared from Coulomb's law, only this time I'm going to do it from the perspective of the unit vector. So this is the generalization of the unit vector. The u here is, um, is the generalization. So this is the unit vector. And the unit vector is the uh, some uh, quantity divided by the absolute value of that quantity. And so in this case, the d is the unit vector in um, you know many mo in most uh, in most mainstream uh, documents you will find that they will likely use R. Robert is tend to use R, but I use D. It doesn't matter. It's a unit vector. This has direction, and um, and so this equation is written now. This is Coulomb's law with the unit vector, and so. Um, so what I'm going to do, and what I did last time, was I converted Coulomb's law using the permittivity of free space. I got it right that time. Uh, permittivity of free space. And I replaced that with the permeability of free space. And so to do that, I have to add this the extra c squared in there because permeability times c squared is equal to 1 over permittivity. And so I can replace 1 over permittivity with permeability times c squared and then group, group the, um, the equation like this and then draw the unit vector here. So this is the unit vector of, the, of Coulomb's law written in terms of permeability. So as you can see over here, the unit vector is equal to some quantity divided by the absolute value of the quantity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this d hat with the d divided by absolute value of d, because that is what this um, generalization of the unit vector means. It means I can replace uh, d hat with d um, divided by the absolute value of d. So then what I do is I um, basically what I'm doing is I'm multiplying both sides by the inverse of this. Okay, so I'm taking this, this um, unit vector here and I am inverting it, you can see, and then writing it over here. So by inverting it, you are annihilating this one and you're replacing the inverse over here. So now you have force times this, the inverse, this is the inverse now of the unit vector is equal to this quantity here. And then what we do is we, div we multiply both sides by d, which is the distance between charges. So by multiplying both sides by d, I am adding a times d on this side, and I am taking away, so now instead of this being squared, it's not squared, and so now I have this, um, this uh, equation here. And so clearly you can see that these two little d's here should cancel, and you will end up with uh, force times the absolute value of distance is equal to uh, this quantity here times c squared. Okay, and this uh, turns out to be e equals mc squared. And so I know um, a few years ago I was debating this with, um, with a fellow physicist and he was arguing that I can't get from here to here because 
force is a vector quantity and energy isn't a vector quantity and therefore I cannot go from here to here but what I showed you here this is why I'm showing you this because I know someone's going to come along and they're going to say oh you can't do that you can't go from here to here well you can as long as you do you know as long as you understand that you're dealing uh, with the unit vector as well and so these are the steps I took I took the unit vector I wrote it out in full and then I uh, multiplied both sides by the inverse to basically put this on the other side of the equation. And then I um, you know, multiplied both sides by distance, the actual distance between charges, which we write here. These two cancel, and you end up with force times distance equals something times c squared force times distance. Uh, I'll just show you this little graphic. Force times distance is actually work. And uh, work has the units of joules. So this is basically E equals mc squared. Okay, work divided by force is equal to distance. And work divided by distance is equal to force. So this is a nice little graphic I found to show you the relationship between work, which is energy, because it has the units joules, uh, and force and but you cannot get from here to here without at least knowing that you're dealing with unit vectors and you have to know how to deal with them and so um, I'm not entirely sure if Robert Distinti is dealing with his unit vectors here properly because he is putting the absolute value um, on the r squared term and uh, and I don't do that I don't do that. I don't put the absolute value. I think he recognizes that there needs to be an absolute value, but the absolute value is in the unit vector. And that uh, absolute value gets um, propagated through the algebra uh, over to this side. So eventually you end up with force times absolute value of distance uh, because energy has no vector. Energy is, it does not have a direction. And so this has to be absolute value force times absolute value of distance, technically, um, to properly go from a force equation to an energy equation. So I just wanted to show you that. Um, I want to make sure that the people out there that are watching my work understand that I understand that um, you can't go from a force equation to an energy equation without dealing with the unit vector. So, um, so that is the purpose of this video. Um, I will be talking more about this model here uh, in terms of what I said in this video. I said some important things in this video uh, which will relate to the next video. So I am going to try and connect this equation here to the physical model that I'm showing here where we have charge separation and a boundary condition. And so, um, oh. That is all I'm going to say for now, and um, I guess I'll be back.